Hello, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the CHBC virtual policy briefing uh, focused on fuel agnostic hydrogen ready stationary fuel cells, the transition from carbon to hydrogen. This briefing is part of CHBC's ongoing efforts to provide timely information on the California hydrogen industry to decision makers and stakeholders. My name is Emmanuel Wagner. I am the Deputy Director at the California Hydrogen Business Council, and I will give a few opening remarks for this briefing. First up, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we, uh, I invite you to send a note to me if you have any technical issues or need assistance during the webinar. Uh, the email address is here on the screen. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar um, a roundtable discussion. Uh, so I encourage you to submit at any time questions using the Q&A box that is located at the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, just type them in, send them in, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. If you would like to watch this briefing again, we will send a note to all registrants when the recording and the slides are published, which will happen in the next few business days. And at the end of the briefing, we ask you that you complete our very quick 30 second survey. So now I would love to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. I'm really excited to have four excellent experts on our panel today. The opening remarks will be provided by Katrina Fritz, the executive director of the California Stationary Fuel Cell Collaborative. Katrina will provide an overview of the current state of fuel cells and microgrids. She then will be followed by Martin Herring, the Technical Business Development Manager at Robert Bosch LLC, who will discuss fuel agnostic stationary fuel cells and their role uh, to meet the goals of decarbonizing our economy. Then we will move to our roundtable discussion for additional perspectives, providing case studies and specific decarbonization goals. For that, I welcome Michelle Sim, the Director of Sustainability at Southern California Gas Company, and AJ Perkins, President at Instant On Energy. The moderator of today's briefing will be Bill Zobel, the Executive Director of the CHPC. I'd also like to take a moment to thank everyone who has made this webinar possible. Special recognition goes to our session sponsor, Bosch, the title sponsor of our series, Pacific Gas and Electric, as well as our program sponsors, Ballard Power Systems and Southern California Gas Company. With their support, we are able to make this educational content available free of charge to viewers like you. Now, really quick, a few words about the CHBC, uh, the host of today's briefing. We are a membership-based trade association that is advocating for the hydrogen fuel cell industry in California. We're heavily focused on advocacy as well as sector action, sector development for fuel cells and hydrogen. And California, as you may know, is ground zero for many of hydrogen-related activities in the United States. Therefore, we target the expansion of the hydrogen infrastructure network for light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles and transit buses. We also seek to create more opportunities for hydrogen to play a role in ports, freight, and off-road goods movement, and help to cost-effectively use curtailed electricity for hydrogen production. Next up, our members. The CHPC has over 130 members, which are representing all aspects and sectors of this industry. In order to get a sense for who supports us, here are the logo of our platinum and gold members who provide much of the many of the financial resources of this organization. In addition to that, we have our silver and innovative members who provide a lot of diversity, energy, and innovative thinking that is required to move the market forward. And to learn more about us, visit our website at californiahydrogen.org. As I mentioned, we represent the industry and policymaking in California, but we also create factual resources and information. We build relationships with influencers and policymakers and provide the opportunity for networking, project development, and interaction among our broad coalition. Some of you may have had the chance to attend our workshop at the ACT Expo last Monday. And so this is the kind of event that we do. And uh, we look forward to hosting many more of those in the near and uh, more distant future. We invite you to consider membership uh, to help your bottom line and to help us make a difference in policymaking in Sacramento and beyond. 
And with that, I'm really glad to move uh, to Katrina Fritz as our first uh, speaker, opening keynote speaker. Katrina, I'm giving you the controls and then take it away, please. Okay, good morning and good afternoon. I am looking forward to speaking with everyone today about stationary fuel cell systems. We hear a lot about hydrogen. So I appreciate that the Hydrogen Business Council has given me the opportunity to talk about how that hydrogen will be used now and in the future. So I um, am Katrina Fritz and I sit on the board of directors of Advent Technologies. I am the um, executive director of the Stationary Fuel Cell Collaborative. And I also um, am on the New Jersey Governor's Fuel Cell Task Force. So I apologize that I, this box is in the way. Okay. So first, the key policy drivers for fuel cells and hydrogen. Right now, we have an increased penetration of renewables, especially on the West Coast and on the East Coast. Um, there is a desperate need at this point for resilience because of grid outages due to various reasons. They can be just due to an unreliable grid, severe weather events that we're experiencing on all coasts and even in the Midwest here. I even had a four-day power outage recently in Michigan. Um, decarbonization, so the reduction of carbon emissions from all sectors a desire for zero emission transportation and goods movement. So I don't just say transportation, while that is very big, we can include in goods movement, everything from ports, you know, shipping, aviation, to the vehicles that we drive on the roads. And community health risk mitigation. I feel that we are just starting to talk more and more about air quality and how the energy sector drives air quality. So the goal of all of these policy drivers is for that greenhouse gas emission reduction and for air quality improvement. And the picture I have in this, so what I wanna to do today for you is to highlight the various ways that fuel cell systems are being used today. So if you look at this picture, this very small structure to the right of this commercial building is 30.8 megawatts of fuel cell systems that are providing heat and power. This is in Busan in Korea. Um, and the thermal energy is being put into the district heating loop and the electricity is being used both on site and being fed back into the grid. So why would we use stationary fuel cell systems? So modernizing the grid is also a theme that we're seeing um, in different regulatory proceedings in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, in California, for example, and now in New York. And fuel cells provide significant system benefits. They are capable of load following and islanding for resilience. They provide a firm, reliable source of clean power 24 seven, which can balance intermittent renewables. They are scalable from under one kilowatt to over 50 megawatts. They provide improved power quality and they have very high system efficiencies. They can be used behind the meter as distribution system resources or as large scale utility generation. So here's an example of hydrogen based fuel cells for electric generation. Today, they are being used at ports and for refrigerated reefers. They are used as power plants, as I said, from under a kilowatt to over 50 megawatts for uninterruptible power supply and backup power, backup power at cell towers, traffic signals, railroad stations, and at commercial and industrial buildings and multi-residential buildings. And they can also be used for shore power. Fuel cells also provide a focus on air quality and equity. So when the power goes out, diesel generators come online. And this slide that was um, provided courtesy of Plug Power shows the emissions difference between a five kilowatt hydrogen fuel cell system and a 20 kilowatt diesel generator and even a 20 kilowatt natural gas generator. So fuel cell systems can be easily refueled. 
they're cost effective. They have reliability that is better than a diesel generator. And the fact that they have almost no noise or vibration or the hydrogen fuel cell systems have almost no heat and there are no air quality emissions or carbon emissions from the hydrogen-based fuel cells. Um, they definitely should be preferred in uh, policy that we have, and I'm going to speak more about policy at the end of the presentation, but there are a lot of customers that are using these today, tele telecom companies, data centers, and I'm going to talk now more specifically. So if you want to know where these systems are being used, the California Air Resources Board has put together a technology clearinghouse. In this technology clearinghouse, they have backup power options for commercial and for residential, and then you can sort this by the emissions category. So if you want low emissions energy technology or zero emission energy technology, um, you can sort this by technology type to look at fuel cells, look at diesel engines, and you can see where fuel cells are being used around the U.S. and it is significant. They're, they're literally being used in almost every state for both primary power and backup power. And this is just to reemphasize stationary fuel cell systems. Now beyond this, we have the transportation and good movement and the forklift trucks and hundreds of thousands of those as well being used today. So as I discussed, there's an urgent need for emissions-free resilience. I can assure you there are fuel cells running today during the power outages caused from Hurricane Ida. We will absolutely share that information with you at some point. I know the companies get very busy during this time, all the fuel cell providers, making sure that the systems are up, running, refueled, and providing the emergency power that's so critical for communications and for public safety. So here's an example from October of 2018. Um, Hurricane Michael came on shore and plug power fuel cells operated for 2,393 hours. And if you look at the bottom, there's also some statistics from October of 2020, both Hurricane Sally and Hurricane Zeta, and that's almost 7,000 more run hours of fuel cell operation in those hurricane zones. Data centers are using fuel cell systems today. The picture in the bottom corner is an eBay data center provided by Bloom Energy. This system has run through power outages. And the reason eBay chose to use fuel cell systems was to, at the same time, replace their diesel generators and to offset their grid that was primarily, primarily fueled by coal. So this is six megawatts of fuel cell systems that are providing that resilience. And all fuel cell systems today, so the Doosan fuel cells, the fuel cell energy systems, the Bloom energy systems that can run off of natural gas can also run off of biogas and they can run off of hydrogen as long as those fuels are available. So Microsoft Corporation has been making great investments in data centers and they're looking at a really holistic approach, how to generate that hydrogen on site all the way to running these fuel cell systems as their backup power and as their peak shaving for the intermittent renewables. Here's some examples of fuel cells and microgrids. There are a lot of fuel cells and microgrids around the country. Um, we don't have as many in California as we hope, but with the industry is working closely as participants to the microgrid proceeding with the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, and this is now a fast tracked proceeding. So we hope to see many more coming online in the next two years. So these examples, these photos show um, one microgrid in Brooklyn, New York, Marcus Garvey Village, which is in a disadvantaged community. And there are fuel cell systems and a solar array here. So when the power goes out, those fuel cell systems back up both the grid and the solar array to maintain power and heat to this village. Oh, power, sorry. Electric only system. Stone Edge Farm microgrid, this is in Sonoma, California. There are plug power fuel cell systems that are provided on site peak shaving as well as backup power. There's a solar array and an electrolyzer that produces hydrogen. The hydrogen is stored on site. There's also battery energy storage, but those fuel cell systems provide that you know, resilient power when it's needed, when the rest of the system doesn't provide the same length of duration of power. 
And below is a very simplified chart borrowed from Bloom Energy. There's a more complicated chart available on the collaborative website showing all the details, but I just wanted to show how these fuel cells are being used here. So they provide power to an elementary school, a library, a senior center, and a hospital. And they provide backup power when the grid goes down to those same facilities, plus a gas station and supermarket, all of which are very critical services during a grid outage. Uh, Ballard Power System is, this is the first one megawatt PEM system being used to decarbonize a refinery. So this is running off of hydrogen that's being co-produced at the refinery. And this is in Martinique. And this is a Doosan system. So Doosan is the former UTC power. They have been in fuel cells for, I think, over 60 years at this point. And the scale of this is phenomenal. This is a 50.16 megawatt system. It's not the largest. The largest is a fuel cell energy stationary system in Korea that's 56 megawatts. But this is the largest hydrogen, direct hydrogen fuel cell power plant. Um, this also puts electricity back onto the grid and it uses byproduct hydrogen from a chemical plant that's locally being produced that would also otherwise be vented. So where are we going in the future? This is provided by Bloom Energy. So this shows uh, the, the tie in directly into the hydrogen economy. So if we have electrolyzer cells on site, they can produce hydrogen from excess renewable generation, wind power or solar power or hydropower. And that hydrogen can be used in stationary fuel cell systems for businesses, communities, microgrids, they can be used in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or any kind of goods movement, as we talked about, or it can be injected into the natural gas pipeline. So what do we need to get to this point? Since this is a policy briefing, I'm just going to touch on some of the areas where the fuel cell and hydrogen industry is working today and recommendations that we have. So facilitating the development of hydrogen and the distribution and creating an economic value proposition for all sectors, meaning electric generation and transportation, is really important. So these proceedings on pipeline injection standards, for example, or the work we're doing in the New Jersey Fuel Cell Task Force and talking about how to generate hydrogen from offshore wind on the East Coast is very important. It's also important to value all emission reductions not just the carbon reduction, but also those emissions that contribute to air quality so that technologies that are improving air quality are receiving some kind of benefit and recognition of that great value to the public um, when competing against combustion and emitting technologies. And including fuel cells and hydrogen and all of the various grid modernization and gas system planning regulatory work that's happening around the country is also very important. So I thank you very much for your time. And at this time, I would like to turn this over to Martin Herring from Bosch to talk more specifically about what Bosch is doing in the stationary fuel cell sector. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katrina, for this very informative keynote, and thanks, Emmanuel, for the introduction. Um, I hope you guys can see my screen. Um, Emmanuel, maybe you can give me a short yes. um, cue. Great. So, um, I'm Martin Herring. I'm with um, Bosch in North America. I'm with our business development division, uh, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity today um, to talk about um, fuel agnostic hydrogen-ready fuel cells and how they can help decarbonize um, society and drive sustainability forward. Um, before we dive into um, some of the market and technical movement, I want to spend a minute uh, to talk about Bosch in general. Um, Bosch is a global provider of um, technology and solutions. We have a little bit shy of 400,000 employees worldwide. Uh, had a global revenue of around $80 billion in 2020 with a share in North America of around $12.3 billion. Bosch is split into four major um, business divisions, um, mobility solutions, where we're one of the leading um, suppliers to the automotive industry, industrial technology, 
And then most people might know us for our consumer goods segment, um, where we provide um, white goods like dishwashers, but also power tools um, to the end consumer. Today, I want to spend more time and talk a little bit about our energy and building technology division um, and what we are doing in relation to stationary um, power and heat. Um, before I go onward, I also want to talk a little bit about the motivation um, behind um, Bosch's intention to invest into stationary fuel cells. And one important point for us is sustainability and carbon neutrality. Bosch has already achieved carbon neutrality for all of our over 400 global locations early in 2020. Um, and this is a commitment that we're not just doing um, for ourselves, but also um, are reflecting in our innovations and in our products driving forward to enable um, carbon neutrality for others, for our customers, partners, etc. With that, there's another layer of motivation um, in the company while we are investing and focusing also on stationary power generation. Um, definitely driven by the electrification of mobility, which is affecting um, our decisions and our innovations in our mobility-driven segment anomaly with investing into um, battery electric as well as fuel cell electric uh, vehicle technology. But we also sort of step beyond this. Um, so how will our ecosystem change around um, our change in the mobility segment and definitely enabling charging for battery electric vehicles, especially in urban areas, um, is a growing topic. With that being said, there's also um, a lot of other electrification um, going on in the urban segment, thinking about more and more connected devices, um, mentioning um, the transition potentially from conventional fuels and heating to electrification, which will put a lot of strains on our grid in urban areas. And therefore we believe that decentralized clean solutions um, can help alleviate some of this pressure on the grid, allow for alternatives and help optimize the system. On top of that, um, there's also a digital layer um, involved with decentralized generation in the future to connect seamlessly to the grid that is above it, communicate with the utility, allow aggregation um, and allow virtual power plants to be able to provide grid services to stabilize the grid around it. But also on the other hand, to seamlessly connect with the customer, provide data that is necessary for the customer to optimize the system performance and use the systems in a decentralized manner whenever necessary. And then again, closing the loop um, to Bosch's sustainability commitment, clean energy for the planet in the mobility space, as well as outside of the mobility space, um, is definitely a huge driver for the company to invest into technologies like stationary fuel cells. Moving on from the Bosch perspective um, to the perspective in California. So California has set very ambitious um, goals in regards to clean electricity, as well as um, greenhouse gas emissions, basically driving for a carbon neutral system by no later than 2045. With that being said, there are a couple challenges um, that arise in California today. Um, Katrina had already mentioned some of them. There are severe weather events um, that cause wildfires and other catastrophes that put additional strain on our grid, um, cause long-term outages for um, a variety of customers from residential to industrial. Um, there are air quality issues, especially in dense urban areas um, related to smog, um, nitrous oxide, critical pollutants, and particles. Um, there's ongoing challenges with decarbonization on the one hand of the natural gas grid, but also decarbonizing hard to decarbonize industries um, like, for example, steel. On top of that, we're moving stronger towards a decentralization system with deploying more and more um, renewable generation that needs to seamlessly interconnect with our grid and support our grid in the future to help alleviate some of the um, pressure on the grid, but also support our drive towards a carbon neutrality future. On top of that, um, there are more and more efforts towards electrification, especially with battery electric vehicles in California, and the buildup of an intense charging infrastructure that will put additional pressure on the electrical grid, especially in areas where the grid is already strained. And then on top of that, uh, on a higher layer, energy storage um, with different technologies is a growing topic to shift uh, renewable generation um, from day to day or from day to weeks or even from day to months um, to have a seasonal coverage to really reach uh, clean electricity goals um, in 2030 and in 2045. So now with that being said, how would a 
solution have to look like from a characteristics perspective to help drive this progression in California towards a clean um, carbon neutral future forward? One point is definitely 24 seven dispatchable reliable power with ultra low emissions in regards to critical pollutants like nitrous oxides, particulates, um, but also in regards to noise and CO2. Technology needs to be flexible from two perspectives. One is the fuel perspective. So it needs to be usable today. And the fuel we use today main is natural gas, but needs to be prepared for the fuels of the future. Natural gas hydrogen mixtures, or hopefully in the future, clean hydrogen. Um, plus we need a flexibility also on application and scalability side. It needs to be accessible for the residential segment, the commercial segment and the industrial segment. And on top of that, um, this is enabled by modular and scalable designs that allow implementation in various use cases, decentralized as well as centralized. Top of that, um, technology needs to be able to help alleviate pressure on the grid, solve bottlenecks, especially again connected to electrification. And then most important, technology needs to be complemental to renewable energies and help the deployment of renewables even more by being dispatchable, by helping out with the intermittencies that renewables um, create by being dispatchable. So now talking a little bit more about what Bosch has to offer in the segment. So we are developing uh, a small scale stationary fuel cell solution, which is shown on the left side of the slide. Um, usually say it's around a medium sized US fridge and we pack around 10 kilowatt of net electrical power in there. Um, and it really comes with high efficiencies of 60% or beyond, basically bringing the efficiencies of large scale power plants to your doorstep. It has ultra low emissions of critical pollutants and noise, even running on natural gas today. It's dispatchable with flat efficiency curves, and that is really important. So again, complementing renewables, if we have to ramp these systems down, they stay at high efficiency levels. They don't lose out on the high efficiency attributes. On top of that, it's a future-proof technology through fuel flexibility today. The systems can run on natural gas, biogas, natural gas hydrogen mixes, and also pure hydrogen in the future, enabling a seamless transition from the fuels of today into the fuels of the future. On top of that, with a 10 kilowatt base footprint, we're thinking about a modular design that allows scalability in various segments, plus enables resiliency in regards to cluster solutions, let's say 10 of these systems on one side. If one system needs to be serviced or has an issue for whatever reason, the other nine systems still are able to provide reliable on-site power. And on top of that, enabling those devices with a digital layer to allow a seamless integration with other distributed energy resources like solar and batteries, plus enabling aggregation and new market mechanism is essential um, for small scale technologies to be successful. With that being said, moving towards some of the applications where small scale stationary fuel cells can be implemented as physical or virtual decentralized power plants, talking about urban applications, commercial applications, all the way to industrial applications, including small and medium sized data centers. A Little bit more background about the path to climate neutrality with uh, high temperature stationary fuel cells. So coming from a situation today um, where we power stationary fuel cells, maybe with natural gas or biogas or directed biogas, um, we see significant reductions of CO2 emissions um, compared to the ever electricity carbon intensity in North America. And we can directly eliminate any emissions of um, nitrosis oxides or particulates with the technology. Moving forward into um, a world where we blend clean hydrogen into the natural gas grid, we will see an even higher reduction um, of CO2 emissions with the same technology. And then ultimately moving forward to a clean hydrogen or carbon neutral hydrogen society, the same technology is able to use this clean hydrogen then to provide carbon free power. So the message I want to send here is stationary fuel cells of today are already ready for the decarbonization of the gas grid. It's not a chicken and the egg. The technology loves to run on hydrogen uh, and is ready for the transition. I want to touch a little bit on the potential applications um, of stationary fuel cells in the ecosystem. And one is definitely in front of the meter. A um, couple customer loads here. Uh, here's the meter and then a variety of decentralized uh, energy resources, including fuel cells, solar, et cetera, um, to connect uh, in front of the meter. Uh, and the role of the fuel cell in this scenario is really to provide grid support, ancillary services and base load um, to support the grid and support the customer loads in the end. 
The second scenario is a behind the meter application um, to put generation as close as possible um, to the customer end load. And in this scenario, yes, the fuel cell can stand by itself and provide a reliable on-site power, but it really shines on a small scale where it can complement deployments of solar and battery. Really act as a team player, as a space efficient, reliable source of power and provide an alternative to increase resiliency that you can use solar and battery as your one leg and a smaller scale fuel cell as your other leg running on natural gas, natural gas hydrogen or hydrogen in the future um, to really provide diversification uh, which drives resiliency. And in the end, both of these in front and behind of the meter are again enabled by the key um, factors of this technology, a future-proof design, modular to be scalable into different segments and then a digital layer to enable on the one hand a seamless integration with other distributed energy resources in microgrids as well as a seamless communication with the utility and the end customer through a digital layer. Now I want to touch on a, on a real example on a case study that we're currently doing in um, central Germany together with the um, municipal utility in the city of Bamberg. Um, they have deployed one of our devices at their new central bus station in the middle of the city to provide electricity to the bus station and heat um, to an uh, adjacent bakery. And the utility was really keen on putting that in a very prominent space inside of the city because they want to give their citizens a touch and a feel um, for this new small scale fuel cell technology. And this is also underlined um, by a statement of the managing director of the utility in Bamberg, uh, Michael Fidelli, who said, the experience we gain with this fuel cell should deliver lasting benefits when it comes to future energy supplies to existing buildings and new neighborhoods. So they're really seeing this in the context of changing the energy provision to the city in regards to existing feedstock or building feedstock, but also to new developments that they're planning in the residential as well as in the mixed use space. To round this up, I wanna to touch again um, on the benefits of high temperature fuel cells that they can provide. Um, we talked about efficient, decentralized and dispatchable solution that can provide reliable power and complement renewables. Top of that, the high efficiencies result in low operating cost, which result in low levelized cost of electricity on par with the electric grid. Fuel flexibility is key with hydrogen readiness to be able to transition into the future. Again, scalability, modularity enables a viability in various locations, applications, plus the fuel flexibility. We can achieve increased energy efficiencies if we can utilize the waste heat, for example, for domestic hot water or commercial and industrial heat. The decentralization of the technology is also able to act as an alternative to help solve grid bottlenecks in the future and lower dependencies on the electrical grid. On top of that, um, with a connected solution that has a digital layer, we can achieve a seamless integration into various use cases and also again act as a team player complemental to existing technology like solar and batteries in the market. And rounding up, Really important are low emissions of critical pollutants like nitrosis oxide and particles today, as well as low noise, especially in dense urban areas um, to alleviate some of the pressure there. I wanna run up um, my presentation. with really saying Bosch is here as a strong and long-standing partner. We are committed to sustainable technology that is invented for life. In regards to our stationary fuel cells, we offer a diverse portfolio stretching from individual fuel cells and stacks over modules to entire systems. So if you're interested in learning more about our fuel cell portfolio or the other portfolio that Bosch has to offer, um, feel free to reach out to me also if you're interested in potential partnerships in relation to our fuel cell technology. And with that, I hand it back to Emmanuel and Bill. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to all of the questions during the round table. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you to both you and Katrina. Very well done. A nice overview, Katrina, of the marketplace and where we're headed. Uh, touching on some policy there as well. And Martin, in terms of you know all of the uses where this can go and the various areas that Bosch and others are involved in the fuel cell marketplace. Um, so with that, as everyone can see on the screen here, we've got a couple of other panelists joining us today. Uh, Michelle Sim, who's the Director of Sustainability for Southern California Gas Company, and A.J. Perkins, who's President at Instant on Energy. 
I would like each of them, uh, starting with Michelle, just to take a moment, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about your company and your plans in the area, and then we'll start our roundtable discussion. Thanks, Bill. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I need to make a note to self that to have Katrina and Martin present with me, you know, going forward in any panel I'm a part of. It's really exciting to see the progress and advancements that really align with a lot of the work that we're doing here at SoCal Gas. Um, so to start off, uh, Michelle Sim, Director of Sustainability at SoCal Gas. Uh, we are a regulated gas distribution company regionally located in Central and Southern California. We serve over 22 million customers in over 500 communities um, that stretches from Central Valley all the way down to the Mex Mexican border. Um, along with our large customer base, we are also the largest gas distribution utility in the nation with over 100,000 miles of pipeline infrastructure. And earlier this year, um, SoCal Gas published Aspire 2045, which is our sustainability plan and climate commitment to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions, both in our operations as well as the energy we deliver to our customers by 2045. Um, all this to say our focus really is on enabling the energy transition to net zero by focusing on one, increasing low and zero carbon fuel transportation through our pipeline infrastructure, um, and two, accelerating resilient solutions for ourselves as well as our customers, and really supporting the efforts to make uh, our clean energy future more affordable and accessible, because that is a, a huge key and a lever um, that will help the general population and public really um, accept these solutions. So I'm really excited to participate on today's in today's conversation. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to you, Bill. Great to have you. Thanks for that, o that overview. Um, AJ, tell us a little bit about, about your company. I'm AJ Perkins, president for Instant On. We are a microgrid integrator. We have been integrating fuel cells into our residential nano grids for some time. Uh, more recently, we secured a contract to build nano grids for 1 million homes for U.S. veterans. We have been looking to integrate more fuel cells into our commercial and industrial sector, where we are partnered with Schneider Electric Green Structure to offer energy as a service for many of the CNI customers here in California to help alleviate some of the capex or the capital expenditure pressures and more recently we have started to move into the utility space where we are definitely looking to integrate hydrogen fuel cells um, where we have partnered with baker energy for a citywide project in the city of california city and this is really exciting to be a part of this so thank you thanks for being with us and thanks to and really thanks again for all of you for giving us your time today uh, we know your time is valuable and we appreciate you taking part in this um, let me let me start off with just uh, trying to give the audience, uh, for those that don't have a, a, a real deep understanding of fuel cell technology, and maybe Martin, we can turn this one over to you. Um, in terms of fuel cells, they come in all different sizes, right? You've touched on some of the, the larger ones and some of the smaller ones and everything in between. Uh, in terms of the energy consumption of these fuel cells, right? Are they are they similar to backup generators, or are we talking massive amounts of hydrogen and renewable natural gas to fuel these? Give, give us some sense as to how all that comes together. Yeah. So in, in regards to efficiencies, uh, no matter of small, medium, or large size scales, fuel cell um, ex, um, achieve outstanding efficiencies comparable to large scale power plants, like combined cycle plants that we build in the multi megawatts or even gigawatts in centralized spaces. So compared to smaller scale, let's say diesel generators, natural gas generators, fuel cells have the ability to outperform those devices um, in regards to efficiencies by a factor of 1.5, maybe to even two. Um, and therefore, the fuel consumption um, for these kinds of devices is comparably low um, compared to existing technology. Um, so therefore, this is also the driving factor for the economics of these systems, um, living off the low operating cost by lowering the fuel consumption to a minimum um, to provide efficient electricity and potentially heat. So let me just ask you then, so does, does Bosch have technology that produces hydrogen as well? Bosch is uh, evaluating with our fuel cell portfolio is that synergies um, towards hydrogen generation, but up to date, um, we are on the hydrogen end usage space, um, not in the hydrogen okay. generation space. Okay. 
Um, all of you folks talked a bit about the resiliency of, of the grid and really resiliency of energy delivery to customers at the end of either the pipeline or at the end of the electrical system. Um, as we move forward in California, we've seen a tremendous focus, increased focus on a heavier and heavier reliance on the electric grid and the resiliency of that grid. We've got these uh, uh, public safety power shutoff events that are happening throughout the state. And we've touched a little bit on the role that fuel cell can play in, in these emergency situations. Um, I'm wondering if, if maybe each of you can just take a minute to touch on what you think policymakers can do to help us improve uh, the role of these zero emission, low carbon technologies in addressing grid resiliency on the whole, and then more specifically, maybe some, some backup generation opportunities, uh, potentially PSPS events. Katrina, maybe we can start with you. Yes. So first is something that I touched on. We need to value clean energy generation over combustion pollutant generation. These technologies are available today. They're being used. Fuel cells are being used today. And that should be acknowledged. And the policy should encourage that, especially for those local air pollutant emission reductions, but also for the decarbonization now and into the future. I think that's number one, is making sure that the air quality is included in all of this policy. And the PUC has done something that's really important in the past month, and that was to expedite track four of the microgrid proceeding. Now, we need to get through this proceeding and start installing microgrids as soon as possible with any technology, right? With fuel cells, with solar, you know, anything that's CARB DG certified that's allowed in these microgrids. Great. Michelle, you have any thoughts on that? Grid resiliency, use of fuel cells? Absolutely. Um, you know, when we think about the clean energy future and we think about decarbonization, um, it's really, you know, three areas um, that we really look at, which is decarbonization, diversification, and uh, digitalization. And as we look at all of the innovation coming online, I think policy really needs to focus on, and I agree with Katrina, um, really, um, I think a couple of these things were touched on already in the presentation is, you know, diversification of tools and resources and clean fuels. Um, but when we talk about resiliency, it's a little bit different from reliability, right? Resiliency is the ability to quickly adapt and adjust and come back to um, its original state of operation, even in the midst of a natural disaster or a wildfire. Um, and I think when we look at the energy ecosystem, primarily composed of the electric and gas grids, the gas grid has proven to be very resilient. It has proven to be the backbone that actually supports the continued electric generation, the continued um, industrial activities that happen in the midst of all of these disruptions. Um, so when we talk about stationary fuel cell application, when we talk about the transportation industry, um, really all of the things that help our economies become stable and actually grow, um, we have to really look at how we continue the economic engines of our state continue to thrive and grow. And you, you need a really resilient system and the gas grid has supported that, continue to support that. And as we look towards the zero carbon and, and carbon neutral future, I think the gas grid plays a critical role, not only in the transportation of lower carbon and zero carbon fuels, um, but really being the backbone that supports the proliferation of renewable um, coming onto the electric grid, um, the proliferation of hydrogen as we can um, really produce hydrogen from you know, renewables and be able to store it in the gas grid um, as a large storage and battery mechanism. Um, so there are attributes I think that um, the gas grid brings in terms of resiliency um, that can also contribute to the backup generation capabilities of industry and critical facilities during power outages. AJ, um, Instant On is on the front line of all this. Um, you guys are putting systems in, building out full-scale cities, right, with, with this kind of operation. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and, and how you've sort of thought through the whole resiliency issue? So I, I, I've been tasked with trying to figure out the not just the transition into this clean energy future, but I think as a company, our number one task is to protect families, communities, and businesses. 
and this resiliency factor that we're talking about, you know, that Katrina and Michelle were, were touching on as far as diversification. For us, as a microgrid company, our primary responsibility is pr to protect those that we serve. So what we have seen more recently is, you know, we put solar batteries, controls to be able to create this solar nano grid or micro grid to protect these families and businesses. And what we have experienced recently with the wildfires has been upsetting in ways that not a lot of people could have predicted. Who would have thought that smoke would have blocked the sun to allow solar to produce? Who would have thought that the soot, because of the smoke that was floating in the air, would have sat on these solar panels? We had some of our systems that are normally enough to produce the power needed to support this resiliency effort, barely able to put out enough power to power an LED light bulb. So when we look at this, our, our those that we serve are investing this money to be able to create these nano grids or micro grids to help protect their facilities and solar alone cannot do that. So the diversification that we're talking about to be able to utilize natural gas, hydrogen is, uh, is something that it's not just nice to think about, it's a necessity because if not, our customers are gonna have to divert to diesel generators and we've seen, we've all seen the challenges with that in so many different fashions. So this is really important, the diversification and more importantly, our primary purpose, which is to protect those that we serve. So one of the questions we get quite a bit about hydrogen in particular and, and fuel cells more specifically is how do the cost of these systems compare to, to the alternative, right? And efficiency is another, another issue. Um, Martin, you've touched on efficiency a little bit, right? And how efficient these fuel cells are and can be going forward. The amount of energy that they consume is, is probably less than other traditional energy sources that would provide similarly situated power. Um, in terms of costs, how, how does Bosch address the cost question? What are your thoughts on that? Yes, definitely. And I want to shift the focus first a little bit towards a lifetime perspective of, of fuel cell deployment, right? You're looking at a device, yes, that comes at higher capital invest um, if you're deciding to buy it, but you're really benefiting from the low operating cost over time. That's how you're paying your invest back. And with that, um, it's definitely not, a fuel cell is not a one size fits all. It doesn't fit every application. It doesn't fit every circumstances. But in a lot of applications, especially in, in California and the northeast of the US, um, there are very attractive situations where fuel cells can be on par with the electrical rates uh, or even significantly lower while still providing all of the other benefits that decentralized dispatchable generation comes with. Um, the ability to harden your facility, provide as we just talked about resiliency. And on top of that, um, everything we talked about, safe real CO2 emissions today compared to the electricity you're buying from the grid, as well as um, low noise and no critical pollutants. So with that being said, it's really coming down to the circumstance that you're in and the levelized cost of electricity over the lifespan of the system that it can provide to you compared to what you're getting today from the grid. Um, we're usually talking about if we think about return of invests, those systems need to be able to reach around three to seven years in payback for customers who are willing um, to invest a bit up front. But as HA already touched on this, there are no business models regarding energy as a service um, or power purchase agreements where end customers get direct savings um, with these kind of deployments by not spending any upfront invest, but just benefiting um, from the load generation um, power. Now, I want to cycle back a little bit um, to um, capital invest for these types of deployments. Um, first of all, there are two buckets of capital invest we need to look at. One is installed capex, which really comes down to what an end customer would pay. But there's a lot of additions in there, the installation cost, the design cost, etc. And usually those systems are deployed in microgrids with other technologies. So in the end, your installed capital invest is a mix between all the technologies you're installing. Now, drilling this down to the technology itself, um, the Department of Energy has set very ambitious targets um, for fuel cells, stationary fuel cells, going down all the way to below $1,000 a kilowatt. And this is a benchmark for all of the manufacturers out there to go down to these prices to enable wide scale adoption of these systems in various applications. And what gets us there is scale. You need mass production, you need scale, you need the market behind it. But we also need a diverse 
collaborative but also competitive value chain um, similar to what has happened in the solar industry 10 years ago or 15 years ago there were a lot of companies that were vertically integrated producing solar panels doing the design doing the deployment and the same thing we need in the fuel cell industry to happen what happened in the solar industry that you have someone who is an expert in manufacturing those systems but you have a lot of others downstream who know how to integrate those systems design those systems so everybody can do in the value chain what where their strengths are uh, and that's how we see this technology succeed in the future nice overview thank you and, and i'm glad you you brought up the the earthshot initiative that's put been put forward by the department of energy the one dollar per kilogram in the decade um, I want to shift over to a, a policy focus here for a moment uh, with our webinar and, and ask Katrina, who's, who's very active in several states across the country and at the federal level, you know, Katrina, what, what are your thoughts on the current set of federal policies that are in play? And then if you could just share a couple of thoughts you have around what states can do to continue to promote the deployment of these technologies as distributed energy resources. Um, We'd love to hear from you in that perspective. Thanks, Bill. Federally, the federal investment tax credit is the number one and consistent incentive that's available for stationary fuel cell systems. It is a declining incentive scheduled to begin um, in 2023, the de declining rate. But it's very critical to have consistent policy. So what happens? Administrations change. They change at the state level, they change at the federal level, and then the fuel cell policy changes. Whereas some other energy technologies have had the advantage of having scaled subsidies consistently for 20 to 30 years, and that makes a big difference in the market. So maintaining those policies, because energy is lifeless. Energy, we all need it, we all need the resilience. Public safety is the number one priority, as AJ said. And you know, that should be the consideration in maintaining these different kinds of policies, whether you're working on the grid modernization or reliability or microgrids. Um, the other important point that I didn't bring up is system level thinking. So right now we have this incentive for this technology at this rate but it expires this year and then a different one for a different one you know technology and we need to think about the energy systems that we want to design that have those key attributes that we're looking for emission reduction reliability resilience so um something you know we've encouraged at the public utilities commission in california is think about a microgrid as a system and you know maybe a system level tariff versus having these individual technology tariffs so that a customer can choose the best technologies and making sure that those are inclusive policies not exclusive so you don't want to pick winners and losers you want to make sure that you put in place um, incentives that reward the attributes you're looking for so we, we shifting gears a little bit. Um, we have a question from the audience about other ways to produce hydrogen. Um, Michelle, I know that the gas company is very, very engaged in all kinds of different opportunities to produce hydrogen. Some very novel concepts, in fact. I was at a, uh, a webinar or a workshop earlier this week at the Advanced Clean Transportation Expo, where one of your representatives gave an overview of the STARS technology that's going to be deployed here fairly quickly. And that presents tremendous potential for low cost hydrogen production. But there are a lot of ways to produce hydrogen. And I know the gas company is working on a lot of different ways. How, how do these compare to, you know, we've been talking quite a bit about electrolysis from, from wind and solar. How do biomass source hydrogen production pathways compare? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, oftentimes when I get these um, kind of nuanced questions, I ask, uh, myself, you know, what question are we solving for here, right? Is it a cost? Is it a question of economics? Is it a question of um, really addressing the impacts of climate change? Um, and I think if it's the latter, I think um, going back to some of the resonating statements from the other panelists is having available resources and production pathways 
um, to achieve hydrogen production and hydrogen availability. Because um, I think getting hydrogen at scale and a predominant use is going to be critical uh, to advance uh, the decarbonization effort. Um, it's a global effort. Um, it's not in isolation. It's going to be a collective effort. I think with respect to um, cost, it will be costly. I think there's no doubt that all the decarbonization pathways and cleaner fuels, it's going to cost more than it is today. So the cost of energy will go up. And the question is by how much um, and can it still be affordable than not for the consumers and the general public and customers. Um, and I think the use of biomass for hydrogen production is something that should be explored and shouldn't be discounted. I don't have specific numbers. I know that there are quite a bit of academia and partners that are examining this today, um, looking at every um, source, meaning what does it cost um, if we are to use electrolytic hydrogen um, source from renewable production like wind and solar? How much would it cost if we use biomass? Um, is there enough biomass to contribute to hydrogen production? So I think there is um, you know, a lot of layering, uh, different questions that we need to answer. But I think this goes back to Katrina's point of you know, looking at it holistically versus one pathway because once you isolate it as a singular pathway you can go in a lot of different ways to explain why it, it should be beneficial um, but when you look at the whole and totality of the market in which we're trying to move um, you know should biomass um, source produce hydrogen um, you know capture 10 percent of the market of what you know the hydrogen availability i don't know the answer to that but I think sure. the you know total you know holistic approach of looking at that is going to be really important in comparing costs and really availability of source material. No, I, we appreciate that. That's a great response, and I think uh, you know you you touched on it a little bit, but you know the cost of our energy if we choose to decarbonize it is going to go up no matter what it is, uh, and often overlooked I think is the impact on the cost of electricity and what that's going to look like. Folks don't tend to focus on that so much, but there are a lot of, uh, of upgrades that need to be done to systems and fuel cells can provide you know, another pathway to lowering the overall cost of building out the grid to serve a large amount of electricity uh, to various, uh, various localized areas through a distributed energy platform. Um, AJ, let me, let me turn around to you for, for a second. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about, you know, heavy, heavy um, electrical users, right? Large consumers of power um, and how, how you might go about evaluating someone like that for an application, uh, a fuel cell application. Uh, what, what steps do you take to take a look at these types of systems? And then in that same line of thinking, if, if there are things that the state could do or policymakers could do to help facilitate that transition, what would you recommend in that in that regard as well? In the back end of that question. So the one, one th the the metric to keep in mind is for every megawatt of power that needs to produce, I need five acres of land to produce that. So with that being said, that's the equivalent of four football fields for me to produce one megawatt of power versus, let's say, if I did use fuel cells to produce that same one megawatt of power, you're talking 20 to 30 percent of just the end zone. So with that, with that in mind, when we look at these heavy users, so California City, as well as many of our other cannabis projects, um, cannabis is a very energy intensive industry, and they may not have the roof space or the land available for us to be able to put the solar that we would need to support their operations. So that's where the, the consideration has to come into play where what sources of generation are we looking at? You know, because uh, the size and space constraints are a huge factor. Then we have to look at how they utilize their load. So some people think if I just turn on all of my lights, that's the max load. But throughout the day, you may use them in different intensities. 
So we need to be able to look at how that load profile looks so that when we design the system, we get the right mix of not just generation, but also storage. And then we also have to look at how does that impact the utility costs when these heavy industrial users are being charged time of use rates, demand charges. I mean, we see customers with demand charges that will take up 40 to 60% of their utility costs. So when we bring in natural gas or hydrogen that does not have the normal time of use charges, that's a real big consideration because now if we cannot afford the battery storage that we would use to help deploy doing those high intensity charges, um, then we would go ahead and look at another technology like fuel cells, CHP, natural gas generators. So there's a lot of complexity in designing a system, but I think a lot of people, when they think about this, oh, okay, let's just go ahead and put a lot of solar. That's the biggest thing is how many football fields is this gonna occupy? Are there other ways for us to, to skin this cat, so to speak? Um, and, I, and I think that's the thing that we need to look at. And, and there's a statement that gets said often. If you've seen one microgrid, you've seen microgrid. As much as I agree and I like that statement, I also hate that statement because it doesn't give us the capabilities to just deploy, 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 and use that as a mass scale opportunity. I think there is an opportunity for us to try to create those compartmentalized and, and, and be able to put them into sections that allow us to create this more templated approach to um, serving the needs of the customer. So on that, from a policy perspective, you, know, you mentioned um, Land use, right? That's what you're focusing on there. Five five acres of solar, one megawatts, five acres of solar. That's a lot of land. Um, that land can be available in some parts of the state where solar is is readily available, like the desert. But transporting that power to the location where it's needed has been a challenge, right? Martin had right. some really good slides on bottlenecks and so forth. And the system we have today has quite a bit of energy curtailments uh, based on the fact that these these systems they, we overproduce solar when we uh, when we don't need it. Uh, we store as much as we can, but we can't store all of it. Sends the wrong market signals to developers with negative pricing. Um, what what's your what are your thoughts on? Um, and this is something we're working on as a, a trade association in Sacramento, providing a wholesale market access rate for the production of electrolytic hydrogen at the distribution level. You know, if we can get costs of electricity down to something under a nickel uh, per kilowatt locally right you can utilize land that's cheap somewhere else bring that power in to the to where it's needed to produce green electrolytic hydrogen at a at a point source that may be very very uh, intense energy user what are, your, what are your thoughts around something like that and are there any any specific suggestions you might have around something of that nature or something similar yeah that's definitely what we're looking at doing you know, in California City, we have an opportunity because there's so much land. So we do have the ability to create a lot of solar. But, you know, again, like you said, the transmission and distribution becomes a challenge. So one of the things that we are looking at doing is incorporating electrolyzers to convert that solar into hydrogen, right? Because sometimes battery storage is really high cost for us. So for us to be able to create that mix of using energy storage as well as hydrogen to be able to transport is there. Um, we also have a portable battery that we actually use. Um, it, it's, it allows us to, we have a 250 kW and a 500 kW that literally is on a trailer. So we could actually power up these batteries and you know, utilizing the solar and being able to send them out to places in which we'll be able to support the need. So let's say if we've got emergencies or we need, you know, we need to deploy it, um, those are the other things we've looked at. Uh, on our side, I, I appreciate you saying that we are producing too much solar, right? The curtailment, even to the point where we're paying other states to take our excess energy, it's sad, right? It's sad that we've invested so much into this, you know, renewable energy space and we're now overproducing. So we've actually uh, started using some technologies that allow us to produce water off of this energy that we're able to do. So, you know, we're doing so many different things to create a better mousetrap, let's call it, to to really just find the best way for us to to help serve as many as we can. Right. So, Katrina, I know you've worked a bit on the overproduction issue with with solar, and you know, uh, 
some of your folks, Professor Jack Brower, who I know you work very closely with, has some thoughts on that. Anything there you want to share with us about, you know, the continued the continued production of wind and solar resources and how those, you know, how we'll continue to need that, I think, going forward, and how that might play into a, a further deployment of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Well, behind the meter there are fuel cell systems installed alongside solar fuel cell energy as a system at uc san diego uh, i pointed to one that's in brooklyn new york um, so that's absolutely an ideal situation as is the stone edge farm microgrid right where they have an electrolyzer solar and the fuel cells behind the meter so it's possible and what it also allows is long duration storage and long duration reliable resilient backup power which is really key so we want there to be you know solar that's available to produce hydrogen so that and then you know there's acknowledgement companies like sunrun have publicly presented on these systems using fuel cells as well so understanding that we can provide that missing link with the long duration capability for power and electric generation. On the utility side of the meter, at these scales we've talked about, like is happening in Korea and Connecticut today in the multi-megawatt uh, scale fuel cell systems, we will need a lot of hydrogen. So producing hydrogen from offshore wind and having a way to transport that or transmit that directly to these um, utility size installations is very important so that you know the utility scale i think is more of a challenge for sure but it, it will require a continuous supply of hydrogen very good so martin let's let's shift for a moment from utility scale down to consumer scale we've got a few questions from the audience about uh, consumer scale products using hydrogen to potentially disconnect from the grid or for other for other uses um where, where's bosch headed with the consumer and products of this nature yeah at the moment um we're we're focusing on the i would say power and heat segment of our 10 kilowatt um, fuel cell that i've been talking about before in the european market uh, we also have a smaller scale version of that um, for residential applications providing combined heat and power um, to residential homes um, and then again hydrogen is, is a very interesting um, energy carrier moving forward so there are definitely synergies um, to other available products especially that we have in the consumer market um, but so far since it's still unfortunately a little bit of a way out till hydrogen is going to hit the market at scales and at cost would potentially make sense to the actually end consumer to us which is often in the residential space and the, in the commercial space right um that's a um, little bit behind our agenda um, fuel cells um, for the mobility segment as well as for the stationary segment um, are very high on our priority right now so aj we've got a, a, a question or really a comment about the city of lancaster and what they're doing relative to hydrogen now, they've come out as america's hydrogen city they're putting forward a lot of projects to position themselves in that manner Tell us a little bit about the California City opportunity that you're engaged with, how, how that came together and, and what you expect the results will be. So California City was, they, you know, it's, it's the third largest city in California based on geographical size. You know, you're talking over 80,000 acres of land and it was the city that never came to be. And one of the challenges of this city is that they're at the end of the utility lines. So as the mayor of a city that is at the end of the lines, how do you try to grow your city if you cannot get the power to those that are trying to come into your city? So the city, the city of California City is focusing on attracting cannabis operations. They've got over 2,100 acres of land designated M1 zoning for cannabis operations. Um, they're looking to attract data centers. They're really working hard to grow their city, but their utility, Southern California Edison, can't provide them the power. We've got we've got communications in which they're saying we won't be able to give you the power that you need till 2030, 2045, 2050. How do you do anything? So about four years ago, they engaged with Baker Energy. Uh, Dusty Baker, you know, the beloved but Dusty Baker went over and said, we can help you. We need to go ahead and create microgrids to help create uh, an, 
your own power supply. And three and a half years later, we were able to cross paths with the Baker team and Baker Energy basically said, we need help. We need somebody that can be agnostic. And that was really important because they've teamed up with so many different entities, but you know, they're solar focused. They're, you know, CHP focused. So uh, instant on is, is tech technology agnostic, manufacturing agnostic. We just want to create the solution. So in working with the Baker Energy team, we have been able to put together a solution and it's a three gigawatt solution with the city of California city as the off taker. And this right here is, is going to be such a beautiful opportunity because it's a blank slate. We have to, they want to be able to produce 25% um, of the power from solar, but the rest of it, they say, we would like for you to help create the city of the future. So we are integrating fuel cells, hydrogen, and you know that's what excites us is that we can use this, what we call the microgrid gap solution. In the industry of microgrids, it'll take 12 to 24 months to build a microgrid. A project like this could take years, but what do you do for the customers that need power now? So we are actually actively engaging with customers now that still can't get the power, and we're putting in these integrations of power generation for them to start building the businesses that they need to while we build the overall microgrid system. So when you talk about Lancaster, Lancaster is also looking to grow as well. Um, we recently got a call saying, hey, can we go ahead and get support to help Lancaster? Because they're right down the road. We've got a lot of opportunity to grow what we're doing at the city of Cal City. And that right there is, again, we're working with many of the utilities. SoCal Gas is actively involved with us because we are trying to create that. Bosch is very much a part of this project to say, how do we give you equipment today? Fuel cells working off of natural gas. And once we have the fuel cell capability, once we have the hydrogen capabilities and the delivery system, these fuel cells can now transition to work off of hydrogen. It's beautiful. It's future proofing what a city like California City needs. Bill, I think you're still on mute. There we go. Now I got sound of freedom overhead here. Military is running their jets today. So, um, Michelle, the next question, AJ had a great segue into my question for you. Um, you know, SoCal Gas is doing quite a bit to look at decarbonizing the gas grid and what that might take. Uh, we've all touched on scale, right, and how scale is so important in bringing down costs over time. You know, SoCal has a goal to start injecting renewable fuels into the pipeline system to start reducing its carbon content. Renewable hydrogen can certainly be a part of that. HA touched on this transition between, you know, uh, the uh, straight fossil methane that may be in the pipeline today to a more blended mix of hydrogen and renewable methane over time. Um, how, how does SoCal Gas see that going forward? This would be the first question. And then maybe on the technical side, we can turn back over to Martin and ask the question of, you know, as the, as the gas utilities start to transition over to that blend where you have hydrogen mixed into the system, how does that impact the fuel cell or does it? Or is it a seamless transition as, as AJ described? So maybe start with you, Michelle. Thanks, Bill. Um, and thanks, AJ. What a beautiful picture you paint for us in terms of building out a city and making them fully functional today and, and you know, supportive towards the future and future proofing, you know. Um, I think, you know, a lot of what we are doing in terms of planning for the future and the role that we play in a decarbonized future is very much how you describe it, AJ, in terms of what do we have today and how do we transition forward to a fully decarbonized system. Um, and as we look at that as a regulated utility and keeping safety at the top of mind, much like everyone else, you know, projects like these take years to plan. And then it takes additional years to implement safely and then operationalize effectively. So I love that Bosch's technology is really looking at how a customer can leverage all of the different types of fuels that is available today and can leverage in the coming future. For us, we're really focusing on um, looking at a few different things. Um, one is um, getting higher levels of low and zero carbon fuels on our system. So we are looking at, you know, today we blend renewable natural gas, which is a lower carbon fuel. We would like to blend hydrogen into our system. We are looking at um, 
really, we started a proceeding with a PUC with um, other utilities, PG&E, Southwest Gas, SDG&E, uh, to really get a standard and protocol in place to advance that so that we can start blending safely into our system. Uh, we are looking at the broader blueprint of our system and looking at what could it look like in 2045. Um, so we are actively doing that work today. We really glean on, you know, globally what other countries are doing today um, and what they can achieve today. Um, I think the complexity of our system um, is something that is not to be taken lightly, um, where we can blend certain percentages of hydrogen at a, a certain level on certain segments of our system. I, I largely, um, you know, bring into parallel um, an analogy of like the roads that we have today, the highway systems we have today. Uh, when we look at the roads that have been built out, um, you know, a large part of California's emissions profile is from the transportation sector, the mobility sector. Um, and my daughter asked me, well, mom, you know, if, you know, if cars are the problem, why don't we get rid of the cars? And I was like, well, you can't do that because people now rely on cars to be able to get to work, to be able to function in society. So we need that. So instead of getting rid of the highways and the roads so that people can't drive on it, we actually improve the technologies of the vehicles, right? To get more and more zero emission vehicles on the road. And I think that's exactly what we're doing with our energy ecosystem today, right? Our gas infrastructure that is massive um, and available to transport large amounts of fuels um, cleaner fuels over time, I think it's exactly like the roads and highways we have. Um, you don't just throw out the infrastructure that you spent billions of dollars to build out. Let's leverage that. Let's repurpose it. Instead of flowing fossil gas through it, um, let's flow lower and zero carbon fuels on it. Let's leverage it as a storage mechanism as we you know, leverage the excess renewable power, produce electrolytic hydrogen, and put it into the gas system to store it so that it can be used later on as electricity. So it can be used later on by customers who are using fuel cells and other applications. Um, so I think we're definitely aligned in terms of how we see the future of the gas system. I think there's a lot of work to be done um, because we wanna do it safely, we wanna do it prudently, and we wanna do it in the most cost-effective way possible today. So um, we are looking at, um, you know, in addition to looking at our system and what we can do, looking at public-private partnerships like the High Deal. Um, I don't know if you all have heard about, but we're collaborating with the Green Hydrogen Council, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Mitsubishi Power, and others to really achieve large-scale green hydrogen um, targeting $1.50 per kilogram in the Los Angeles basin by 2030 so that we can make green hydrogen cost effective. And once we get it to scale, um, it's not going to be easy to truck the volumes of hydrogen that's needed for industrial application, for manufacturing applications, or critical facilities like hospitals. Uh, you're gonna need an effective way to transport that, and that deals a lot with cost too, because when it comes to cost, it comes down to three things, right? Production of costs, um, transportation costs, and really the demand for hydrogen, right? And, and where that supply demand comes in. So all of these cost variables, I think are tied to policy and legislation um, and signals um, that are given to mitigate significant risks by both market developers and consumers. But um, a lot of our focus is on flowing lower and zero carbon fuels on our system, supporting the public-private partnership to build out the market as quickly and um, effectively as possible so that consumers can have the lower cost option. I think you've touched on a point that a lot of people miss, uh, and I'm glad you highlighted it, that the issue really, the carbonization issue is not that an energy delivery system, the pipelines themselves, that's a very reliable, very resilient energy system as you pointed out earlier. Uh, what, what we're trying to change and what you guys are working very hard to change is what, what runs through those pipes. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not the system itself that's the problem. It's 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 the pipe. It's what's in the pipes, and we're working hard to decarbonize that as we go forward. So um, thanks for sharing that. I thought you know the overview, and I think the leadership that SoCal Gas has shown in this area is is really setting the pace for the rest of the industry. So I think we all thank you for that. Um, Martin, let's let's get over to the technical here for just a minute. We've got about ten minutes left, but there there have been some questions about 
you know, sort of transitioning from a pure methane system to a, a mix of methane and hydrogen. Um, and then I've got a couple other questions for you about cost, but we'll come to that second. So why don't, tell us a little bit about the, the technology and how it works with, with blends and say increasing blends of hydrogen over time. Definitely. Before I dive into the technical side, I want to echo one point that Michelle just made, and this is really this transitional piece um, of our natural gas system today. And thinking about what we're doing on the electrical system, it's a transition there too, right? If you look 10, 20 years back, we used a lot of coal, gas powered, yes, some nuclear and some renewables for water, but our grid wasn't green and our grid isn't green today. But we set targets to go into transition towards carbon neutrality in the future. And the same schematic should be replicated for our natural gas grid too, allowing a decarbonization for all connected devices, but it's not happening by fl flipping a switch, right? It needs to be a transition enabled by end applications, as well as, as Michelle said, by production that is at scale and can provide costs um, that make a difference. And that leads me also to the fuel cell. Today, natural gas uh, is the fuel that is available at prices where it makes sense for the end customers to use a device like a fuel cell. But we have seen a lot of issues uh, or activities globally that aim around a maximum of around a 20% blend of hydrogen in a natural gas system initially. And that are already values that we are testing in pilot deployments in Europe today. We're already blending um, artificial 20% hydrogen, bottled hydrogen in our natural gas feed to run our systems. And we see no effect on performance up to 20% of hydrogen blend. Now, moving forward into a scenario where you wanna use 100% hydrogen and you are sure you're never gonna use natural gas again, there are some components inside the fuel cell system that are abundant then that could lead to an optimization of your system when you are sure you're never gonna use natural gas again. With that being said, there are definitely some upgrade costs uh, involved if you wanna transition from a blended scenario into a pure hydrogen scenario, if you wanna leverage all efficiency benefits that you wanna have. If you are okay with a so-called flex fuel operation enabling one day natural gas, maybe the next day you have hydrogen available at low cost, then um, you potentially I'm going to have some efficiency penalty, but not dramatic efficiency penalty. Um, I hope that answered the question. I think you did. I think you got at it. And I'm going to ask you a follow-on question. Um, and then I'm going to go through a couple of the other panelists with, with the same question. So you touched a little bit uh, earlier on the learning curves of some of the other um, decarbonizing technologies like wind and solar, right? They, they've had a tremendous amount of public policy support. The learning curve that comes with scale has really brought down those costs to levels that are something folks would not have even thought possible 15 years ago. Do you think that the the current slate of incentives that are in place today are putting us on a path similar to wind and solar? And do you think that there are other things that could be done to help accelerate that learning curve that policymakers should know about? I strongly believe with the current global push towards hydrogen in Europe, as well now starting in North America and also starting in Southeast Asia, there is huge potential uh, to enable scalable production of fuel cell as well as electrolysis. And there are a lot of synergies between these technologies and the potential to scale in mass manufacture and bring down costs on both ends, fuel cell as well as um, electrolysis. Um, there are definitely incentive mechanisms that can help um, speed up the deployment, um, referencing what's happened before in the wind and solar industry. And um, these are things combined with the pathway towards hydrogen um, and enabling scalable hydrogen production and consumption, as well as promoting fuel cell technology as a viable source of end usage of hydrogen, again, on a transition towards 100% decarbonization um, and definitely um, incentivizing in regards to clean technology that can save CO2 today um, would definitely help those technologies on both the hydrogen generation front as well as on the clean energy generation front um, move technology forward. I would, I would direct the, almost the same question at you. Um, you know, do you. Do you think learning curves are headed in the right direction? And do you think the policies that we're looking at or that we have in place are sufficient? Or are you seeing things that 
could be done in additional states or that we should be doing that we're not doing? What are, what are your thoughts relative to policies that can help move those learning curves at a more accelerated pace? I think the hydrogen shot from the Department of Energy is a ginormous step in the right direction, right? They are also looking at hydrogen hubs. This is the concept that's been very successful in Europe to look at regional system level deployments of hydrogen and fuel cells in multiple sectors. Um, the hydrogen hub concept, I think, will take us quite far in this high deal. Uh, Green Hydrogen Coalition Initiative that Michelle has referred to is the first of its kind in the U.S., but it's not the first of its kind in Europe. It's modeled after high deal Europe, and those hydrogen hubs will allow, um, I think, us to also identify what are those policy barriers more strongly. That's something they're working on on high deal. You know, what, what precisely do we need to address from a regulatory perspective? to transport hydrogen across state lines, for example, right? So it's learning by doing at this point. Um, we've had a lot of studies, we've had a lot of analysis. You mentioned I work with the team at UC Irvine and uh, they conduct this work every day, but we need to move to you know, working more with the utilities, like in the hydrogen pipeline injection standard proceeding in California. Um, and we need to start this on the ground kind of work where we're having more of these large scale demonstrations in the US. And I think the federal government is now pushing us in that direction and the states at this point will follow. And I don't often say that, usually it's the other way around in the clean energy sector, but it's really encouraging. AJ, you guys are on the front lines. You're putting in projects right now, delivering microgrid systems. What types of state policies in particular and then federal policies too would help you deploy more systems faster and accelerate those learning curves you know i i appreciate you keep saying that you know we're on the front lines because um i feel i'll feel honored to be in this environment because i've got a manufacturer i've got a utility i've got a policy advocate all in the same conversation and like you said i we are the guys that that are out there you know, knocking on the doors, meeting with clients, finding out their pain points and trying to solve, solve problems. So when it comes to the policy side, as much as the, it influences how we do things, it doesn't change the importance and the urgency of the need. So um, to be able to take what, what policy advocates like Katrina and her team and the many others out there that are doing, um, that helps move everything along on our side my my plea really is everybody come and see what we're doing come and talk to us you know um allow allow yourself to be able to come into our world and and be a part of this california city project manufacturers come here come and see what's going on i can tell you the honorable mayor Jeannie o'laughlin she is waiting for anybody that can come and help us she wants to grow her city. The people in the city want to create better opportunities for those that live there. So this is an open slate. Manufacturers come down. There is no one company in the world that can give us the three gigawatts of power that we need. We need all to come and participate. The utilities come in, learn, learn from what we're doing, teach us how we could be better. And the policy people, this is really where it's at. Come and look at what's going on. See how we're making these metrics work because this isn't a project funded by grants. Let's hope that this works. This is a project that is really needed and we're getting real money behind us. Real investors are saying, here's our checkbook, let's go ahead and solve this big problem. So um, it's, it's important, it, this is a call to arms. We have one project that could be the, the opportunity for people to learn and use that as a template and be able to continue to help more cities like this. Well, I want to thank you all very much. We are we are just about out of time. Uh, I think we've, I know I've learned quite a bit just listening to you all talk about uh, how we can deploy these technologies and develop policy to help move them forward. So um, Emmanuel, let me turn this back over to you to close it out with about a minute left. All right, Please sounds, yeah, yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, so, I want to extend a thank you, of course, to our sponsors here. Um, we have a Bosch for the session sponsor for today's briefing. Uh, thank you for PG and to PG&E, uh, Ballard and SoCal Gas for their support. Um, of course, this would not be possible without 
uh, those additional um, financial s support mechanisms. Um, also, of course, a huge thank you to all the panelists here. Um, and I uh, uh, appreciate you all spending the time. I, many thanks to all the audience members uh, and, and your many, many, many questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, um, but uh, you know we tried as, as hard as we could. Um, so we will um, make this presentation um, and the recording of it and the slide decks available. You will get a notice in the next couple of days uh, when those are published on our website. Um, you'll get a notice via email uh, so you can access that. You can also contact uh, our team at CHBC here, uh, Bill and myself, uh, contact information is here. Um, and you can, of course, follow us on the usual uh, you know, social media uh, networks. Uh, or just subscribe to our mailing list and you'll get notifications about what's coming up, um, briefings like this or other activities. Uh, you know, not to say that you can join us as a member if, you're, uh, if you like what we do, if you like what you uh, heard today, you want to be part of the industry um, like so many others, um, please consider joining us. Uh, that is easiest done through our website, uh, but of course you can also contact Bill and me. And then uh, finally, um, we do seek your feedback on this session. Um, so take a look at the uh, survey that is coming up in a, you know, after we close out. Please, please do take that 30 second survey. It will make our work uh, better in the future. It will inform our decisions and provide us with topics to cover in the future. So um, thank you so much for everyone here. Um, with that, uh, uh, let's close out this webinar and um, and this uh, bill or panel members, if you have any final final remarks. Thank you all very much. Sounds Thank great. Thank you to our audience and our sponsors. Have a great rest of the week. Hello. Thank you.